Mold battles bacteria. Sulfa enjoyed a time of immense popularity, but even before it came into general use, penicillin, the most important of all antibiotics, had already been discovered. Alexander Fleming, a Scottish physician, served in the Royal Army Medical Corps during World War I. After the war, he attended St. Mary's Medical School in London and graduated with honors. He chose to stay on at St. Mary's Medical School as a teacher, rather than seeking a job elsewhere. St. Mary's was an old-fashioned school. Alexander Fleming's equipment at St. Mary's was rather simple and limited. His laboratory was in a roughly furnished basement room. An open window provided ventilation. Dust and leaves drifted in with the fresh air. His conference room was a nearby park bench under a huge elm tree. Despite the primitive conditions, Dr. Fleming did what he could. During one experiment, he grew some deadly little staph bacteria. He wanted to learn more about them for a book he was writing. Staph bacteria cause boils and other infections. Dr. Fleming grew the bacteria on the surface of a jelly-like food in a shallow dish. For several days, the colonies of staff had been growing on the jelly-like food. One day, as Dr. Fleming examined a dish, he saw that it had become moldy. A mold spore had fallen through the basement window and into the dish. Suddenly, he peered closer. He saw a circle of clear liquid around the deadly staph bacteria. The dark green mold had dissolved it. What had been a well-grown staph colony was now a faint shadow of its former self. Alexander Fleming identified the foreign mold as penicillium, a type of bread mold. Like all molds, penicillium is a tiny living organism which belongs to the fungi group. When Alexander Fleming worked with penicillium, it was classified as a plant. Although, like mushrooms and mildew, it contained no chlorophyll. Penicillium develops from spores. A spore falls upon food and begins growing by putting out hair-like roots. Alexander Fleming correctly guessed that penicillium mold releases a chemical that kills germs. He named the chemical penicillin. Although a chance discovery, Dr. Fleming instantly grasped its significance. Suppose he worked in a clean and spotless laboratory. Suppose a chance breeze through the basement window had not carried that mold spore. Suppose Fleming himself had cleaned the dish and put it away without investigating. Then one of the most powerful drugs known would have gone undetected. Of course, the new chemical might also damage human cells. All the germ killers then in common use were as dangerous to the host as they were to bacteria. To be useful, a substance should destroy bacteria without being toxic to the patient. Dr. Fleming transplanted a bit of the mold into new dishes. Slowly, his dish garden yielded enough mold for him to experiment further. He injected mice with it. The mice survived unharmed. Apparently, the mold produced a chemical that killed bacteria, but not the cells of larger organisms. Here was something special. Growing the mold, extracting the penicillin, and concentrating it took too much time. Dr. Fleming never developed enough to tackle real diseases. Each precious sample could only be used for trial cases. To make it in quantity, he needed assistants trained in chemistry and a better laboratory. Alexander Fleming was a physician, not a chemist. In May 1929, he reported the discovery and invited any interested chemist to pursue the matter. The report aroused little interest. For almost ten years, his paper on penicillin lay forgotten on the library shelves. Then, Salfa came on the scene and captured world attention when it saved the life of Franklin Roosevelt, Jr., son of the American president. Until the success of Salfa, 
few doctors believed chemicals taken into the body could have medicinal value against bacteria. They still believed vaccination was the way to prevent infectious diseases. Sulfa proved that chemicals could make dramatic breakthroughs in fighting disease. If one chemical, such as sulfa, could destroy bacteria, then maybe others could do. When World War II began in 1939, the search for infection-preventing chemicals became more urgent. More people died from disease and infection than from bullets and bombs. Several big firms in England followed the lead of IG Farben in Germany. They offered research grants for doctors to look for disease killers. Dr. Howard Walter Florey, an Australian physician, received a large sum of money for his investigation. He had two advantages preparing him for a future success. He was a researcher at the well-equipped Oxford University Laboratory, and he had a brilliant assistant, Ernst chain. Flory and Chain did their homework. They read hundreds of back issues of medical journals. They came up with three articles about the work already done in the field. One of the three articles was Fleming's original paper. Flory and Chain traveled to St. Mary's to talk personally with Fleming. Dr. Fleming had not given up completely on penicillin. He still kept a precious sample of the original mold alive. For ten years he'd grown it, transplanted it from one dish to another, and kept it at the right temperature. Dr. Fleming gave Flory and Chain a sample to take back to Oxford with them. The Oxford scientists succeeded in isolating penicillin, the actual chemical involved. They found that penicillin in the pure form was even more powerful than Fleming had dreamed. It took two years of hard work before they grew enough penicillin to treat a human patient. In a nearby hospital, the doctors were trying to save the life of a policeman. The Oxford Bobby had nicked himself while shaving. Infection set in. His temperature soared. Sulfa drugs proved to be useless. The policeman's doctors did not believe he would live another day. They heard of Flory's work, and they asked him to treat their patient. Flory diluted the drug so he could stretch it out over several doses. After the first injection, the policeman's temperature dropped, and his breathing became easier. His face, which had been red and puffed, began to look normal. The next day, the temperature went up again. Flory gave the man another shot of penicillin. Again, the policeman proved. By the fourth day, the doctors could see that the patient would recover. Then, horrified, they learned that Flory had run out of penicillin. It would take him weeks to make more. The doctors watched helplessly as the patient's temperature rose. Finally, he died. Penicillin was horribly expensive. For that single patient, it had cost a thousand dollars a day. It is not practical, most doctors decided. It takes too long to make enough penicillin to do a patient any good. Despite the setback, Flory knew that penicillin was even more important than sulfa. It wreaked havoc on bacteria that sulfa couldn't touch. Penicillin had fewer dangerous side effects. A thousand-fold overdose could be given before it became toxic. We simply must reduce the cost, Flory said. Chain agreed. Penicillin needs to be manufactured by the ton, not by the ounce. Because the bombing of World War II made England a poor site for chemical studies, the English scientists asked doctors in the United States for help. In the summer of 1941, Ernst Chain flew to America. He carried with him a vial of penicillin mold. It was a remote descendant of the original speck that had settled in Dr. Fleming's dish twelve years earlier. American scientists quickly discovered ways to grow penicillium in quantity. Mold would grow within a jelly-like food as well as on its surface. They built huge vats with paddles to stir the mixture. The mold grew all through it. 
American mass production turned out penicillin as easily as it turned out cars. In January 1943, they purified only two ounces. By September, two pounds. By the year's end, a thousand pounds. Penicillin became the doctor's best weapon for fighting infection. It fought bacteria that caused meningitis, pneumonia, strep throat, and bone and blood infections. Although it does not kill the bacteria, it apparently prevents them from forming a protective cell wall. It weakens the germs so the body's own defense can finish them off. For Dr. Fleming, the years of discouragement of trying to interest people in penicillin ended. Recognition came to him. He was knighted. Sir Alexander Fleming. In 1945, Alexander Fleming, Walter Florey, and Ernst Jane shared the Nobel Prize in Medicine for their discovery. Doctors still battled infections by bacteria that resisted the action of penicillin. Maybe other molds would fight these diseases. The idea set off a mold hunt that is still going on. The search has discovered streptomycin and other antibiotics like penicillin. Although penicillin can be made from scratch in the laboratory, the process is much too expensive. Molds do it better. However, chemists have learned to stop molds in mid-step, so to speak. They separate a partially completed penicillin molecule. To this core, they tack on other chemicals. These tailor-made antibiotics are sometimes better than penicillin itself. For a time in the early 1950s, doctors hoped diseases could be eliminated one by one by developing the right wonder drugs. This turned out not to be the case. Microorganisms develop a resistance to the drugs used against them. Doctors must constantly search for new chemicals to combat new strains of disease germs.